everyone. This is Marlene Van Nelson from Trellis Legal here today. And I'm going to be talking about getting legit, understanding your business's legal checklist. So we're going to be talking about what are some key components uh, of your business that you should make sure are in good legal health and how to tackle those. A little bit more about me. I am the founder and principal attorney at Trellis Legal LLC. It's a small law practice. We're located in the Lawrenceville neighborhood. And we work with all sorts of small businesses, makers, um, food businesses with their business transactional needs. So setting up entities, tackling contracts, things like that. So a lot of the stuff we'll actually be talking about uh, on this presentation. So let's get started. First, uh, we're going to be looking at the key legal components of your business, tackling a checklist of um, looking at those components and breaking them all down, making sure you understand them some next steps, and then some resources to help you out with those next steps. So what's important to remember is that your legal health is like your own health. If you're not taking care of your business's health, it could have long-term consequences. So if you don't have the proper agreements in place or an entity to help protect your liability, these are things that could really um, bite you in the butt in the long run. And so like it, it's similar to your personal health and that it's good to have checkups and take preventative care measures to uh, avoid any kind of long-term impacts that could be much worse. So where do we start? Uh, just like with your personal health, we start your legal health checkup with a checkup. So just like going to your doctor, you're coming to this presentation and having a little checkup on where your business is at in terms of your legal health. So we're going to break down the checklist. I have it here um, and analyzing the health of each item. So that's what we're going to be doing today is we're going to look at each of these items bulleted here and talk about what they really mean and how to approach them for your own business. So the first one is I have an entity or fictitious name for my business. So let's start with kind of saying what are those things? So an entity is something like an LLC or a corporation or a nonprofit corporation. And what it does is it pro provides protection from personal liability. What that means is, is that if someone were to sue you um, or go after the business was for debts, that they would not be able to go after your personal assets if you have an entity. Only the business assets and business liability is at risk. So it protects you personally. So if you own a home, car, other assets, if you have a business, if someone was suing your business, like if you had an LLC, they couldn't go after those personal assets. So that's a big benefit of having an entity. Um, it's also great if you are having more than one owner. Um, or are going to have investors or other relationships in the future where it might be helpful to have an entity. Sometimes this even means if you're on your own, being set up to apply for grants or loans where it might be beneficial to have an entity. Or if you have more than one person in your business, an entity is a great structure to provide the right venue for having more than one owner and having a proper partnership or multi-owner agreement and the liability um, it's clearly within the company and not you individual owners, um, which is just a real benefit. In Pennsylvania, it's actually pretty cheap to have something like an LLC because we don't have any annual filing fee requirements. Um, you can be taxed very similar to if you are a, a sole proprietorship or partnership. In, in, in fact, you can actually be taxed as a sole proprietorship or partnership if you have one uh, member or multiple members. And you can also choose other tax structures so that as you grow, you might be able to choose a different tax structure for your business that is gives you some tax advantages. Whereas if you remain a sole proprietorship or partnership, which means you don't have an entity, you might not be able to choose those tax structures to help you. So something like an S Corp. So entities are really great. I really like them for businesses that are higher liability if you're making a, a product or something like that, it's it's really great to have that liability protection and that structure. And again, it really can help you provide uh, a good structure for applying for loans and other things. Oftentimes they look for these types of things. A fictitious name is something you use if you don't have an entity, so you are a sole proprietorship or a partnership, but you're doing business under a name something you know, other than your own. So if you, um, you know, our cats crafts 
and you're doing business as Cats Crafts, you have a website for that, but you don't have an LLC or anything filed with the state under that name, you need to file a fictitious name, also called a doing business as. And what this does is that if you're not really ready for an entity yet, and you aren't using your own name, like your last name for the name of your business, you file this fictitious name registration with the state. And all these filings and all these formations, what they're really about is making sure that there's a way that customers can find out who they are doing business with and how to contact them, which they can't do if you're doing business under a name other than your own and don't have it filed with the state. So that's why it's kind of important to think about those things and know the difference. And I usually say, unless you are just getting started and you're not sure if you're gonna be moving out of state maybe, or you're just doing a little freelancing on the side and it's something like graphic design, very low risk, then maybe it's okay to, to stay as a sole proprietorship uh, or partnership if there's more than one of you and file a fictitious name. But if you're gonna be doing anything higher liability or have more than one person in the business. Um, and something like an LLC can be a really great option because they really provide liability protection without much additional cost. So there's not too many detriments and you can keep the same tax structure. So here on this slide, I kind of break out how. So for an entity, if you have more than one owner, it's important you discuss forming an entity with the other owners. You have to form it uh, with the state. So like I said, for most small businesses, an LLC in Pennsylvania is a great option. Um, you can form corporations, but oftentimes they come with more administrative requirements and tax filings than uh, an LLC, which usually isn't necessary for a, su a super small company that doesn't have investors or anything. I do recommend working with an attorney um, if, if possible. Sometimes we just kind of know what we're doing. We've set up a lot of these so we can, we can help you do this. Um, also account for existing contracts and work. So if you've been doing business not under an LLC and you're forming an entity, it's important to make sure that you inform people who you're doing business with of the new existence of the entity so that the liability can all transfer to under there. And for a fictitious name, you have to um, file it with the state. Now you can also file fictitious names if you have an LLC and are doing business under something other than the LLC name you have filed with the state. I'm not gonna get too into that right now, but it's just an important consideration that you always need to make sure that the state has a record of the name you're doing business under. But for now, I'm just talking about fictitious names if you don't have an entity. So you have to file it with the state. It's a $70 filing fee, but you also have to meet an advertising requirement. You don't have to do this with an LLC. So it's an important distinction. What the advertising requirement says you have to advertise that you filed a fictitious name in a newspaper of general circulation as well as uh, the legal journal for your county. So it's important to know that there's that advertising requirement. It's not technically valid if you don't do that. And you don't have to submit the advertisement proof to the state, but it is going to be something uh, that's looked at in terms of compliance. Um, so that's kind of the next steps in terms of forming that. And the LLC does have a filing fee as well with the state, $125. So next is I have an operating agreement, bylaws, or partnership agreement. So what this is, is that if you have an entity, um, you need to have what's called a governing document. And you'll see that a little, little lower in the slide and we'll get to that. If you are not an entity, but have more than one person running your business, so you're a partnership, it's recommended that you have a partnership agreement because you really want to detail how you make decisions, who has authority, maybe if you have different ownership percentages because the law will imply 50-50. And I always just say it's really good to have things in writing because that way it's not to really always come from a negative place of I don't trust you, but it's from a place of, hey, let's make sure we're on the same page, literally. Um, and so like I say on the slide, it helps things run smoothly, make sure everyone's on the same page. And if you have an entity, it helps prove that limited liability. Just because you filed an entity with the state doesn't actually mean you're fully entitled to that limited liability. You have to prove that you're running the business truly separate from yourself. And we'll talk about that more later when we talk about some of the accounting things as well. But governing documents are one of the ways you help prove that if you have an entity. So what is a governing document? 
It breaks down key considerations. It talks about your ownership percentages in the company. Even if you're a single member LLC, it's 100% ownership. Have voting, so how you make decisions in the company. Again, even if you're just one owner. How you add and remove owners, so in the future or you know, if you have to remove somebody. Having procedures for that is so important. So many times I see people don't have agreements or have ones that kind of downloaded quickly off the internet um, that don't account for these things and it can cause a lot of problems and potentially even bankrupt your company if you don't properly account for adding and removing owners. And who gets to make those decisions? Compensation, how you're deciding how you pay yourselves. Um, tax election. Um, now, if you're a partnership without an entity, you can only be taxed as a partnership. But for um, if you have an entity, there are different tax elections you can make. And what happens if you want to close the business? That's what dissolution is. So to start thinking about these things, it's good to talk through these questions with your part, with a part, your partner. So if you're a single member business, then you don't really have to. You just kind of have to codify this, write it down for yourself. But if you have more than one owner, it's important to talk about uh, these issues I talk, you know, list on this slide before you draft an agreement or have one drafted for you. Because um, even if you work with a lawyer, they're going to ask you these questions and it'll be important to have thought through them. Um, so what is everyone con contributing to the business? Are you putting in money? Are you putting in time? How are decisions made? Does it have to be unanimous, a majority? How do you allocate profits and losses? Do you pay people out based on ownership or hours worked? Um, again, what if someone decides to leave the business? What if, how do you decide if um, you want to add people? And are there any other policies or considerations you want written down? Again, if it's something that could potentially do a dispute, like how you're compensating yourself or your, yourselves, um, or how you are adding members or removing members or how you're valuing the company, who can sell their shares, um, do they need approval, all those kind of things, that's the kind of stuff you want to have in writing. So that kind of deals with the kind of first steps of setting up an entity or taking care of the kind of formational and basics of having a business set up, whether you're an entity or not. So now we're going to kind of talk about the next components that's actually outside of legal, but running a business and legal often are intertwined with financial and tax decisions. Um, anyone who's worked with me knows if I'm setting up an entity for you or talking about your business, many times I'll say, hey, this is a component that we should run by an accountant as well. And so it's important to have a relationship with an accountant. Oftentimes, if you work with a lawyer or many other uh, business service providers, they can refer you to someone. And you should talk to them about the tax considerations, about setting up an entity, any tax filings you have to do. So federal, state, and sometimes even local have um, tax filings. In Pittsburgh, we definitely have a business registration tax. Um, any accounting, so how to know what is deductible, what's not, what kind of records to keep. And it's just a good way to make sure you understand all the financials because running a business does have significant financial considerations that you should be aware of. Um, and accountants can also help with employee registration requirements. Um, so if you end up having any W-2 employees or even if you have contractors, they can make sure you're filing the appropriate forms and sending the appropriate forms to the people who work for you. Kind of along that same financial line, it's important you have a separate business bank account. This is especially important if you have an entity. If you don't have an entity, I still think it's a good practice um, because it helps you keep your business money and kind of keep clear business records separate from your personal money. Um, and that's just a way to see how your business is doing. So it's important for your legal health, but also kind of your overall business health um, in terms of how well financially is your company doing. So I recommend it really if you're an entity or not. If you are an entity, it's essential to help proving separate limit, limited liability. Again, if you don't really operate the business separate from yourself, um, someone suing you could do what's called piercing the corporate veil, which means they could say, look, this LLC is in name only. You're really not operating this separate from you. Therefore, I should be able to go after you for liability. And so keeping all your money separate is a good way to help prove, look, I'm really running this separately from myself. It also makes accounting easier, as I mentioned. And the rule of thumb I always tell my clients is you can always buy business things with your personal account and you can always reimburse yourself or deduct them separately. 
but you should never buy personal things with your business account. So even if you go out to dinner and you realize you forgot your business uh, or your personal credit card and you only have your business card and you're like, oh, I'll just put it on there. Nope. Ask your friend to spot you and Venmo them or pay them back later because it's important you really keep those things separate. And if you do by accident buy something personal with your business account, keep a record of it, reimburse the business, um, and make it clear that that was a mistake in terms of having records of it and reimbursing yourself. Um, and shop around for a separate business bank account. Oftentimes people just go with the business that they have or the bank that they have their personal account with which isn't a bad option, but sometimes certain banks charge uh, fees if you don't have a certain amount in your business account or for certain bells and whistles. And so it's important to shop around to find a business bank account and ask them questions like, do you have a minimum account requirement? Uh, do you have these features? Because sometimes you might want certain payment processing features and things like that. So make a list of questions. A lawyer account is happy to talk through those or even just Ask to meet with a business uh, banker at a bank and ask them what services and, and how their pricing is structured for business bank accounts. So the next one is I have insurance. Insurance is, you know, it's actually a second bullet point here, but is the first line of defense. Limited liability is great because it separates the business from your personal, but your business is still at risk. If you were to get sued, and even if you have the limited liability or LLC, if someone's able to go after and collect against all your business assets, that could make your company bankrupt and you could stop having a company. So it's a good protection for your personal assets, but not a good protection for your business assets. And that's where insurance comes in. Um, insurance, like I said, is that first line of defense so that if something goes wrong, um, or like as seen in this picture, you your business location catches on fire, um, you accidentally get a candle burning and it causes damage to your property and your business and your equipment. Um, insurance can help with that. And the one thing I always say is people will say to me, well, do I have to tell my insurance agent about X, Y, Z? And the answer is your insurance agent is not someone you should kind of omit things to in order to save money on a premium. Because that means that if you don't tell them about it, you're likely not going to have coverage for it. So it's important to be honest with your insurance agent about all the activities you're doing to make sure you have coverage for all of them. And ask them about the certain things you're concerned about having coverage for and if your policy covers it. And it's always good to check up on that, that anytime you add a new line of service or component to your business, to check in with your insurance agent to make sure it's covered. The next one is, I have contracts. And as we say in the first bullet point right here, good relationships start and maintained by being on the same page. Um, I love this pun <laughs> because it's so true. Um, you want to make sure that you and your clients or employees or contractors are all on the same page. And that's important not only for liability reasons and intellectual property and all these things we list on this slide, but also because it's good for a long-term relationship and so that the relationship runs smoothly. If you and your if you start drafting a contract and your client is like, well, I didn't know about this, this, and this, a contract is a good place to discuss that before work begins. Once work begins, it's harder to have some of those difficult conversations because you can't point back to something that says, well, I understood it to be this way. And so that's why it's important to have, to protect your liability, um, but more importantly, to make sure that your business has good relationships and you can focus on getting work done instead of fighting with clients or employees or contractors about something that you could have accounted for in a contract. So things like client agreements, uh, independent contractor agreements, if you're using subcontractors or having people contract with your business, NDAs, which means non-disclosure agreements, um, which help protect confidential information. If you have contractors or employees who are interacting with confidential aspects of your business that you don't want them telling anybody else about, if, especially if they're an independent contractor and working with multiple companies. Intellectual property language, this one is huge for makers and creatives because it's important to know who owns the intellectual property that you might be creating under a client agreement or even sending a preliminary design to someone um, before they've engaged you to actually make it. Do you own that or can they go and take that and have somebody else make that? 
for cheaper. Um, so it's important to have good intellectual property language. And again, it just helps things run smoothly as well as avoid disputes and protects your business. Um, and sometimes people think, well, contracts means this long seven page contract full of language I don't understand. But sometimes contracts can even be uh, as simple as terms on a purchase order. If you are someone who makes basic products or design elements or even just putting something on your purchase order that says like 50% deposit required, non-refundable, once work begins, non-refundable once work begins, if you cancel within 30 days, I'm paid for any work completed. Basic terms that even could just be a couple sentences can be crucial. And I've even had clients where um, they didn't have a long contract, but they had a few sentences on their PO that actually protected them in terms of when they got into a contract dispute with someone. Um, and the next one kind of actually dovetails uh, nicely from contracts, and I mentioned them a little bit, is that intellectual property, like I said, especially for creative businesses, is a crucial component of a business. And so it's important to know what intellectual property you have, what intellectual property is, if you're not sure, um, and how to protect it or make sure you're transferring it properly. So talk, this is something where, you know, there's lots of legal things that I kind of say, Look, I understand people don't have a big budget, but so you can tackle some of them on your own. Intellectual property is a complicated area of law and that can have big ramifications for your business. So I really recommend talking to a lawyer about this. Oftentimes lawyers will do free initial consultations and they can tell you at least the things to be thinking about. And then you can always spend some, you know, invest the money in having them help you navigate some of these things if they identify important aspects for you to work on. Um, have language in your contracts. So I once had someone who had a contract and they made websites and their contract said that the client um, at the end owned all the components of the website and design, but they were actually using uh, that template that, you know, over and over again for different clients. But technically, according to their contract, they sold that template to the very first client they used it on. And they were actually in violation of the intellectual property clause of their own agreement every time they used it because technically they didn't own it. So it's important that you have language in your contracts that properly accounts for your intellectual property and if you're transferring it and if you are, how, are there any limitations or are you keeping all ownership of your IP? Um, so contracts, like I said, that's a crucial component of, of intellectual property. Um, also, including ling marks and language on designs, preliminary codes, proposals, etc. So this is something as simple as putting a copyright symbol on a uh, design that you send someone. Um, so if you're sending someone a bunch of designs for preliminary approval, you put the copyright symbol on them so it's clear that you own those until the scope of work is done, or you know until they decide on a final design because maybe you want to use one of, if they don't choose one of your designs and you want to use the similar type design for somebody else, it's clear that you have the right to do that because you own it. Or I've heard stories um, actually at a Monmade event where someone set, uh, sent um, a preliminary proposal design uh, to a client and of, you know, all the different products that could be made and a interior design of a building. And then that client actually took that design and gave it to somebody else to make. So our client lost money, and they, the client, uh, our, my client, the the um, the maker, lost money on that deal because uh, they had their intellectual property taken. But there was nothing that clearly said they owned it. And sometimes you still have claims to it, even if you don't. But it's so much easier, and it acts as a strong deterrent to somebody you're giving documents to if it says clearly this is a preliminary design property of X Y Z company. Um, something as simple as that. Um, also make sure that any clients and contractors in your business are not infringing on any intellectual property rights in your work, social media, etc. I had a client who has a Instagram and they down, you know, one of their admins downloaded an image from the internet and posted it on their uh, Instagram just from Google Images and they got slapped with a cease and desist and we ended up having to negotiate a $600 settlement because that image was owned by somebody else. And there are actually these crazy 
IP law firms that just troll around looking for people who have violated uh, intellectual property. And so it's important that you're using either copyright free images um, or making sure that you're creating original works that don't incorporate those and making sure your clients aren't giving you um, intellectual property that is owned by somebody else and they don't have the rights to. And that's another thing that can be good to incorporate into a contract. And again, this is just an important area, as you can tell, there's a lot of, you know, kind of unique and detailed considerations that it can be good. This is worth spending a mo the money on a lawyer for. Next is I've looked into employment considerations. Um, if you have anyone working for you, it's important to know for you to know the different legal considerations and requirements. So if you have someone who's an independent contractor working for you, it's important that you make sure that they actually should be classified as an independent contractor. The IRS and um, legal precedent has established clear factors um, that deal with are you an independent contractor or not. And I've done some blogs on this, so you can go to um, the Trellis website and click on blogs and search for the one um, about independent contractors that talks about some of these factors. But it can be extremely costly to employers. They can be responsible for back tax withholding and other penalties if someone who is classified as an independent contractor really should have been um, an employee. Um, but sometimes you do just have independent contractors, especially in creative fields. You might contract someone to design a specific component of a larger project or something like that. And so in that case, it's important to have an independent contractor agreement. Again, it's mostly so you can make sure you're all on the same, same page regarding the scope of services, the pricing, the invoicing, payment terms, but also um, things like intellectual property and confidentiality and number of scope uh, reviews that are involved in work and things like that. And then if you have employees, it's actually important uh, usually that you don't have a contract because in Pennsylvania, we are an at will state, which means that um, the employee can be fired or leave at any time um, without cause um, or notice. And um, so what that means is that if you have a contract that can sometimes rebut against that at will status, which could lead to wrongful termination and things like that, but you do have a duty to have um, employees uh, sign certain federally required and state required forms to make sure you understand any um, paid sick leave and other leave requirements and non-discrimination um, components. So that's where employees are kind of in an area where an accountant um, or, or attorney or if not an attorney, an HR professional can really help you make sure that you're navigating and keeping all the proper records and timekeeping and all that for the employees. Um, and lastly, I spoke to a lawyer about my considerations specific to my business. Every business is unique. And so, so many times people say to me, well, what are the things I need to be thinking about generally? And that's kind of what we're doing here. And there are some things that apply to all businesses, but also especially specific creative businesses. Do you need to be worrying about products liability? Are there any specific licensing or um, regulations that apply to your industry or your specific scope of work? Um, are there certain types of contracts you should have that are specific to your business? Do those contracts need to contain certain language? So for example, if you're doing any work that is um, the same as like a construction contractor, then there's actually certain requirements by law you have to have in your contract. So things like that is where it's important to talk to an attorney. And also, as mentioned, intellectual property is very specific to the type of work you're doing. So that can be another important thing to talk to an attorney about. So I know that was a lot and <laughs> we covered it in like 30 minutes. Um, but don't worry, uh, I've actually put together a checklist that details all the things we just talked about and it has nice little boxes that you can actually physically check off, which I always find really rewarding. I'm a big to-do list fan. And you can go through them and triage them, check off the things you've already tackled and then you know which ones you still need to look at. And it even has a detailed um, breakdown of, you know, kind of going over some of the things I talked about in this presentation. Also, after you kind of download that and take a look at them, once you've identified the ones you might want to focus on, have an initial discussion with an attorney and accountant. Many, like me, offer free initial consultations and analysis where we make a to-do list for you and what we need to do from the legal side and give you quotes. And that way you can then decide how you want to work that with your budget. 
And other service providers, so like Bridgeway and the Creative Business Accelerator, often are knowledgeable on some of these factors and can advise you on what might be important for your business or connect you to the right service providers to help navigate that for you. Why is this all worth it? This seems like a lot. I've been running this business for, you know, let's say you've been running a business for seven years, never had any problems. But the problem is 1% of the time can result in 100% of the losses. So liability protection is crucial for your business. You don't want to have to, you want to have the right structures in place so you don't have to worry about those things. If you have co-owners, this is the number one area I see disputes arise that if you don't have a proper plan or operating agreement, governing document, things like that, that if something goes south with your co-owners, which I know everyone says they don't think it will, trust me, some, you know, a lot of times it does, plenty of times it doesn't, but you want to be prepare, prepared for if you don't. And I even started my business with a partner and we had a great operating agreement and plan so that when she decided to leave the business, there was no disputes. We looked at our strategy that was laid out in our agreements and our resolutions and we were able to move forward smoothly. So both of us were um, impacted in a positive way and able to move on with what we wanted to do without it damaging the business. It also helps because it provides proper documentations for loans and grants and you know, et cetera. This is something I often work with the Creative Business Accelerator on um, that you know, they often say, oh, this person needs this and they don't have it. Can you help me help them get it set up? But if you have all this set up, then you don't have to create any wait time and uh, applying for loans and grants or things because you know you have all the right documents. And also it just helps with the long-term business sustainability. If you have these things set up, then it helps you make sure that you always have them ready. You always are ready to tackle anything and you don't have to be thinking about it. You can be focusing on your business. Um, and again, I'm not here to shame you or tell you if you don't have these things, you know, your business is in terrible health. It's called a checkup for a reason. It's just a check in and see what we can tackle. Again, comparing it again to your personal health. There's always little things we can do to improve for our own personal health. And it's the same way for your business. If you haven't been doing it in the past, hopefully it hasn't had any negative impacts for you. And that gives you an opportunity to make sure it continues not to by getting all these things in line. So thanks, I hope this was helpful. Um, so go to my website, trellispgh.com, and if you scroll down, you can sign up for our resources list, and um, you'll get our, the resources we put out. So this month's August is actually a, a client contract checklist. Um, so you'll get uh, kind of important things to make sure your client contract includes. And then our July one was the legal health checklist. So that's the one that this one directly relates to. And that's what you can use to help guide you through the things we just talked about. Then you'll also get a COVID-19 waiver and you'll get future resources that we'll be putting out every month that are completely free, um, which does not happen much for legal. And so this way you have different resources you can use. Um, and remember, check things off as you go. You don't have to tackle everything in one day. Reach out to the people, the service providers, the lawyers, the accountants in your community. They can help you. You don't need to tackle this on your own. And take deep breaths. <laughs> it's so stressful running a business sometimes. And so you don't need to beat yourself up for the things that you haven't done. You just need to make a list of how to tackle them. Another exciting factor is that actually September 1st of this year, um, Trellis Legal will be launching a Trellis template library. So again, I know legal costs can be hard to budget for. And so I've put together detailed contracts with uh, explainer boxes for every single paragraph, explaining all that legalese for you, how to fill them out, that you can use for basic things like client contracts, independent contractor agreements, photography releases, um, if you're taking pictures for your business and have people in them. Um, amend, contract amendment uh, templates, which are great for if you have a contract and then you and the client change the scope of work. Again, you want to have it in writing. Um, and they'll be much more affordable than custom legal work. You can download them directly, so you just purchase it like any e-commerce. It downloads to your computer and then you can create, you're basically drafting your own contract, but from a solid legal base. And then if you're a Pennsylvania resident or business, you can uh, reach out to Trellis and see if we can review it for you. That would have to be subject to an engagement letter and everything, but um, at least gives you a great starting point for some of these things if you can't afford to have a lawyer 
do everything custom for you. Again, I'm Marlene Van Nelson with Trellis Legal. I have my contact information there. I am a Pennsylvania attorney and only licensed under Pennsylvania law. And this whole presentation is uh, under Pennsylvania law and specific to Pennsylvania considerations. A lot of them generally apply to your business, but things like filing fees and annual costs, those will often be specific to a specific state. Um, so that's important to know as well. And good luck out there.